for a meeting of the Village of Trustees for Tuesday, October 15th, 2024. Please stand and say Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first item is approve the regular minutes of the October 1st meeting. Second. Any changes? Roll call vote. Trustee Pashima? Aye. Trustee Braden? Aye. Trustee Stithway? Aye. Trustee Fisher? Aye. Trustee Burns? Aye. Trustee Bain? Aye. So President's comments, uh, Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia will be hosting a town hall meeting on Tuesday, October 22nd, 2024 at 6 o'clock p.m. at the Hinsdale Public Library. Congressman Garcia will share updates with residents on federal, state, and local matters. Okay. Residents who are interested in attending can register online via event, Eventbrite at uh, dupagetheventbrite.com or by calling Congressman Garcia's office at 773-342-0774. Early voting for 2024 general election will take place from October 21st to November 4 at the Memorial Building for DuPage County residents. Voting hours will be from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. on weekdays and 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. on weekends. Additionally, the Memorial Building will be a polling site on Election Day, November 5. For a complete list of locations for early voting and registration information, please visit the DuPage County Election Commission's website or for those residents who live in Cook County, the Cook County Clerk's website. The free weekly fall leaf pickup will begin on October 28th and run through December 5. Leaves must be bagged in craft paper yard waste bags and placed alongside the curb. For more information, please visit the village website. Okay, that takes us to first read. Luke? Yep, uh, which moves us to agenda item 6A. Um, this is a text amendment to section 9-107 of the code. Uh, it's relating to landscaping and screening standards. Luke, I'm sorry, are we supposed to have citizens petition? Oh. Yes, good point. So this is a okay. petition. Do you want to wait, talk now, or talk some other time, or not talk at all? Maybe not at all. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no citizens to petition. I can't believe we Sorry, forgot, about, forgot about Bill. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> all right. Uh, so again, this is a text amendment, Section 9-107 of the zone, Zoning Code. Uh, it relates to landscaping and screening standards. Additionally, and I'm going to go over this at the end, there are various sections of the code which are also being amended in order to be consistent with the changes to 9-107. Um, I'm going to start this out by, you know, we typically go through two reads. This is a, this is a complicated text amendment. There's a lot of details to it. Um, if trustees feel that we should do three reads for this, I don't think there's any rush in this at all. Plan Commission has been working on it for eight or nine months, so just keep that in mind as we go through this. Uh, the text amendment has been uh, pursued by staff at the request of this board. Uh, please recall, we have had difficult site plan reviews with regards to landscaping and buffering for commercial properties that border residential areas. Uh, for example, Land Rover with the fence and ongoing issues with plant size along Oak Street. Uh, I think we can all recall residents coming and saying the plants weren't high enough and they're not growing. Uh, then also uh, 110 East Ogden Avenue, uh, that was where the chiropractic office was, and uh, landscaping along the back of that commercial property. And then lastly, Union Church and landscaping barriers between residential districts and its parking lot. Uh, this text amendment aims to minimize the impact of redevelopment on nearby residential properties by improving screening and promoting better landscaping practices. Um, you know, if you look at our, view, our code or a general overview of our code, it provides for us and sets up so that we have so-called minimums and maximum requirements. For example, we have minimum front and side yard setbacks. We have maximum height for buildings. Uh, for landscaping in general, we've not had minimum requirements. Um, this text amendment seeks to establish minimum requirements not only between residential and commercial districts, but for all districts. Um, Additionally, this text amendment provides for flexibility around landscaping and screening standards, which can be approved by this board on a one-off basis. Uh, this text amendment also promotes specified types of plantings 
minimum planting sizes and maintenance requirements. Um, this was originally referred to the Plan Commission in January of 2024. The Plan Commission did hold public meetings in March, July, and August. Um, there was a material amount of discussion and debate about the requirements. Uh, ultimately, the Plan Commission made a unanimous decision to recommend the following changes to us. Uh, one, to increase the height of landscape screening. Uh, they, they actually ended up keeping it at six feet tall with a minimum landscape buffer of five feet along the side and rear lot lines of residential properties. Did I get that right, Bethany? It's six feet as written now? Six feet for the screening area between a non-residential and a residential property. And then they um, upped the size of parking lot perimeter screening. So the area around a parking lot would be three feet tall. Three feet, which is currently 18 inches. It was, it was uh, lower previously in the previous version. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, a minimum, a minimum height for fence along any rear lot line. So, you know, we've got minimum, we, we're establishing minimum requirements for landscaping and also a minimum height for fence. So it's my recommendation. Like for example, at behind 110, we put up Arbor Vitae that were, I think were 10 feet or taller and we didn't have a fence. I think that while well, the plan commission, they went back and forth quite a bit and they said six feet for both. With the flexibility that this board, that this text amendment gives the board, I think we should start out at eight feet for both with the ability to go down to six feet. So for example, if we have a commercial property that is building up against a, you know, a, a, a large area, a wooded area, we could go down and reduce any landscaping requirement they have. But if we do have a situation like 110 East on Og or Ogden Avenue again, we can require that eight feet. And all of us sitting in this position before and, and going back and forth with developers, I always think it's easier to go down than it is to say, hey, you have to go up. And if we start at six feet and say it's six feet, then we've got to tell potential de commercial developers, oh, you have to go higher than what the code outlines, even though we have that. So that, that would be my suggestion, but I, I think we should, we should discuss that. Um, the text amendment also clarifies that berms are still subject to a minimum height requirements. We've had a lot of times where, you know, developers will come in and say, I don't need to put up a eight foot tall tree because I've got a four foot berm, so I should only put up a four foot tree to get a total of eight feet. This clarifies that berms don't count in the height. Um, as Bethany mentioned, uh, minimum planting size of 36 inches at a time that shrubs are planted around uh, parking lots. So 36 inches, three feet tall, should stop headlights from going into residential properties. And there's always ambiguity in the code when it says, you know, when developers come in and say, well, within a year, it's gonna grow by 50%. So it'll be up to 24 or 36 inches by that time. This clarifies it that it's at the time of planting. Um, there was discussion around a preferred plant list. I know we had uh, <clears throat> Trustee Fisher came and said we wanted to have, you know, certain plants that were preferred. Uh, with discussion at plan commission they also have that but they said you know what let's leave that to the um let's leave that to the pros as far as uh the um who are the places around here that provide for that morton arboretum morton arboretum they Chicago always botanical garden yes okay. both of those areas or both of those entities provide preferred planting list and what we've got in the what we've got in this text amendment right now is we just defer to those, uh, to those organizations and their preferred planting list. We also have improvements to stormwater management infrastructure, uh, provisions for parking lots and requirements for storage of snow, which we've never had before. So in landscaping plans now, there's gonna have to be detail of where snow is gonna be piled up. We don't get snow anymore, do we, Neil? Well, no, I, I just don't know how we're gonna, you know, we're still gonna get some snow. And, and what if we have this Okay, we, the snow goes here, and what if we got a big snowfall? And you know, well, well, it's well, that's why we've got the. That's why we're going to have the flexibility. Yeah, but it's they're going to have to outline. We're that still going to get snow. We're still. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But the, we just have. Maybe. Let's just say we have to have a place of where they're going to put it if they yeah. if they plow the driveways. Um, also, we're going to include uh, outdoor refuse storage and service areas to have the same parking or the same screening as parking lots. Uh, an added section that the village forester would review existing vegetation and planning for applicability when reviews do occur. So if someone's coming in and looking at change and they have a site plan review, the forester will look at the existing plantings on the landscaping plan and make sure that it's a, 
that it's reasonable. Also then maintenance of landscaping, uh, plan requirement of how it would be conducted, including routine watering. Um, as was mentioned at the beginning of my comments, we're also amending certain other sections of the code uh, so they remain consistent with the general applicable terms around screening and landscaping. Um, this is detailed, but I think it's important. Uh, and the other changes that uh, are gonna be made so that they're consistent is section 3-106 regarding special uses, 3-110 uh, bulk space and yard requirements for uh, single family residential, uh, 4-107 for multifamily residential, 6-110 special use for office, 9-101 special use for accessory structures, 11-503 for variations, 11-603 for plan developments, 11-604 for site plan review, and section 12-206 definitions. All of the changes to those sections, which I just mentioned, just make it so that the wording definitions are consistent with section 9-107, which is where we're making all of those changes. But just, I wanted to make sure that that was clear so that we're consistent. I would also note at the last meeting, we approved the um, community development consultant that we're using on, a, uh, on an hourly basis. They were integral in helping with like this. Yes, thank you, FESCO. Um, so that, that is a, an example of where that, that has been helpful. Um, Again, and in summary, these amendments provide for clarity on landscaping and screening uh, regulations. And most importantly for landscaping and screening requirements, the board has the ability to waive minimum requirements, which allow for a more efficient application process. An applicant does not, will not have to go and attain a formal waiver from the ZBA. So for example, if we have an existing property that only has two feet of setback between the parking lot and a property line, this requires now for new that it be five feet. The board can waive that rather than going to the ZBA. But again, that's only for landscaping and buffer requirements. So with that, I would open it up to questions. Input from Bethany and Rob, who've worked on this for nine months. Anything I missed or anything you'd add? It's a great summary. Great. So look, I did have, I had one question. So I mean, obviously this is a standards document which is something that was sorely needed, um, which, you know, provides for, just as I said, the standards as it relates to, tr you know, bush height, things of that nature. The one, the one question that came to mind as I was reading through this document was the enforcement side. Yeah. And um, that, I mean, that obviously isn't, that's not the purpose of, of this particular study. The purpose is standards. But to me, that's something that we'll have to use or go hand in hand um, with regard to the, the enforcement of making sure that, you know, we, we, we've had kind of this pervasive attitude where people, you know, it's the, it's the cliche of forgiveness instead of permission and how are we going to avoid that scenario? And so that's, that's the one thing that, that went through my mind as I was reading through this. Yeah, I, you know, I've had discussions with regard to that and in, in general, I think 90 plus percent of people comply, you know, they, they water, they water things so that they grow and they're maintained. Um, you know, it's the it's the small minority where we don't have that, and really we rely on residents to comment or ask us to fix it. I don't think staff has got the time to really, you know. Oh yeah, I'm just worried about situations where you know we, in, I'm, without naming names, we've had you know one particular individual with regard to Land Rover that we've seen a lot, yep. and. Um, and it's a situation where you have complaints, well, you know, or we have a situation uh, over on Ogden Avenue um, where the individuals were like, why are we letting them come off permit, you know, if they haven't complied with certain things? And, and to me, it's, it's having some level of understanding of how do we avoid those scenarios. Well, I mean, the, the way this would come up, right, is if somebody's redeveloping a property, they come with a design for a building and these would kick in. That's yep. a typical way to come yep. up. Or the Land Rover is an example. Well, Land Rover or the, or the or the other building on on Ogden you yep. mentioned, but you know I wonder whether the village should be in the business of policing people watering flowers or plants down the road. I mean, it seems to me that that's really not. You know what I mean? That's I, I don't know how you, how you handle that, but I mean to 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 have an enforcement mechanism where we're like. You know, it's just not part of the approval process, but two years down the road, say, people come and say that bush died and they didn't water it. Can you do something? I'm not sure that that's really the village's job. Yeah. Maybe oh, and I, I agree with that. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Yeah. So, I'm looking at more during 
the time of construction. Well, no, going, you know, it, when they're under right. permit, that's that's what I'm concerned right. But about. this would be I mean, here. Here's the way. This is why I think this is a good good way for we as a board have focused a lot on what the building looks like, right? The setback of the building, the height of the building. And in the last two or three projects, the only snags we've run into have been landscaping. The buildings have been fine, and all of a sudden somebody comes back and says, we don't like the landscape, we don't like the bushes or whatever. So, so that's why I think this is good to codify this, and so we have a baseline that we can deal with. But I, I view that this is be part of the process. So now when we're looking at the building, you know, we also have this, these text amendments that say you have to have so many trees, you have to have so many shrubbery, you have to, the trees have to be a certain height. And if somebody wants to change them, like they'd have to change some aspect of the building, they'd have to ask for variance. And then it, and it highlights the issue. Yep. It highlights the issue. We, just, we don't just look at it and all of a sudden say, you know what, those trees are only three feet. We, that's too short. But we really didn't focus on that because we were looking at the building. So it, it, it would like bring to our attention things that are varying, vary from the standard so yep. we could focus on it. I mean, that kind of, to me, is, you know, and this is given a lot of thought. So these baselines, while they may not be perfect, at least they're done in the abstract without any particular property in mind, what everybody thinks is a good idea. Now we have a baseline, and we can deal with it on a, on a project by project basis and modify this if we have to, but, but it, would, it, would be, it would put it into stark relief that this is an issue. Right. These trees are shorter than they should be, or, yeah. or, or the, you know, that the, the land is, you know, closer to the to the property line than, than we had envisioned or something like that. So, I mean, I think this is, a, I mean, I, I don't know that, from my perspective, I'm more glad we have this than to take issue with any particular aspect of it. I mean, I think having a baseline that people thought about is a good starting place for Absolutely. the board to move forward. Agreed. And that's, yeah. and that's not, that we did not have that at all. Before. No, we didn't have we anything. So and difficult. then you're surprised by, it's a great building, and somebody comes in and says, well, but they cut down all the trees. Well, yeah. we didn't know that, yeah. you know. So uh, I, I do think this is a great way to do it. Now, and then what about, I, I didn't see this in there, but what about existing trees? Do we have anything in there about, you know, having to, to talk to us about existing mature trees on a property if they were to redevelop? There is a section under the general requirements about uh, reviewing the existing vegetation. Okay. That would be brought in as part of the landscape plan. Okay. Um, and they can use that as part of the compliance, but obviously we'd want to preserve what we can as right. well. Right, right. But, but to me, the whole point is to surface the problem, yep. right? I mean, that's kind of what this is all about. And this having a, having a baseline like this surfaces the problem. Um, I wanted to thank Bethany and Rob and the Plan Commission for the hard work here. I've read through all of this. I know we all have read through this, and it, it, it is a lot. Wow. Um, I believe these measures will certainly enhance our village landscape, and it will make it easier for all of us to navigate landscaping plans here. Um, the goal is to help further beautify Hinsdale. And these amendments, they will provide consistency related to the landscaping plans. This amendment would provide clarity related to the landscaping plans. And along those lines, and with what you said, Tom, is I've requested that we kind of have a cheat sheet or a cover sheet, which outlines, you know, suggested trees, like suggested trees be clearly outlined, suggested plants be clearly outlined. Um, and also if we could provide examples of what we have liked in the past and what we have approved. Um, again, the key is here to provide a baseline so we know where we're at. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to reevaluate everything we have some guidelines here in a cheat sheet slash cover sheet that will you know, outline what we are looking for. Um, clarity is key, and I believe this will get us to that point. Yep. One question that I will open up for a discussion if we want. Driving here, you do see some trees going in right now. They're tiny. They look like a little peanuts tree. Should we think about maybe, maybe making the caliper three inches or maybe a little bit bigger that we are requiring folks to put in? Um, it's a thought, you know, I don't know what anybody else feels about that. Um, I do, don't think we need something that's gigantic, but maybe something that's a little bit more robust will help make the landscape a little bit more mature, a little bit more mature from the get-go. Yeah. It's, it's reasonable. Good to get, it's reasonable. Be good to get John's opinion yeah. on that. Yeah. 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 We can, again, thank again. you. Yeah. I, I have some questions, or Neil, do you want to go first? Uh, okay, let me ask one question. I think President Colley might have already addressed it. Page 7. Uh, and are you in the actual ordinance? Oh, yeah, I'm in the actual ordinance. Page yeah. 7 uh, talks about the components of a landscape plan. 
So it lists a whole bunch of stuff here for a landscape plan, and I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in hand, uh, landscape plans. So like with McLaren, when, you know, they, 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 that's one of our most recent right. projects, and, and I know they did a lot of landscaping around that, so did, would they have covered, would they have met the requirements of all of this stuff? And, and maybe they don't have to based on what you were saying. They're you know, not, we, first of all, they're not abutting any residential property. That's one difference, I think, for some of the things we've looked at. But you know, I, I, we didn't have the, obviously this wasn't passed at right. the time we approved that. And, and then the other thing I thought, I looked at this and I said, is this over the top? Is this too much stuff? But, but like you said, we don't have to have them do all of this stuff right. necessarily. But, but it gives you, but what, I, what I'm saying is when, when somebody asks for a variance from something, then we know what it is. We know what the plan commission thought about, what the staff thought about as a standard. And whether or not it makes sense to deviate from the standard we can obviously do, but then we know what we're deviating, and we make a we make a you know a considered decision to deviate from that. So I think a lot of context to it, and a lot of detail is helpful because it, it raises those issues to the front. So they thought about this is what we should be doing in the abstract. So how does it apply to the situation that is before the board? So I think this is a great piece of work. If I may, for what it's worth, this is not unusual. Bethany looked for most of this when we did the review for Mouse Motors anyway. Yeah. So th this isn't. So we just codified things we were looking at. Right. These right. are pretty standard yeah, requirements. Yeah, I don't, if I don't a landscape that, so. architect okay. is putting a It plan just seemed together, like a lot of stuff. The new things that are a little it's bit a abnormal terms. compared to other places that they don't always require it, uh, require it is the snow removal or snow storage area. That was a, a recommendation by the plan commission. And then we did ask, we are asking people to just tell us how they're gonna water things. And that's for the enforcement side of things, just so we know right. that they have a plan for keeping those plants alive. Is it, um, even if yeah. it's a water truck, at least we'd wanna know what the plan is. Should we, what about the thought of having, requiring sprinkler systems? I mean, to the extent that we don't wanna police these things, if we require a sprinkler system, at least we've done something to ensure that things will, is that, is that over the top? I wonder if that would be, difficult with outside of churches that would have more green space a lot of these are yeah. parking lots right right, um, right just thinking the infrastructure of, of getting that on in ground right. sprinkling system yeah. in place yeah. Bethany or Rob does it I, give you enough wiggle room at EG that Neil was just speaking about the location of any underground irrigation system so that's, we, that's on our punch list but so it I think certain, some people use a truck. Yeah, mm -hmm. they drive around. Yeah, and make right. Yeah. The village does. You know, yeah, the water first. Right. Yeah. Right. Water. Well, I just planted what 14 arborvitae on my side yard, and they put up socos in and put yeah. a, on a That's timer. Right. right. So maybe we could require something like that for a couple, because it takes for for bigger trees like arborvitae, you know, it takes you two years for them to actually root the root system to develop. So maybe we, you know, what they do is just they wrap up uh, socos around it, and maybe we require something like that just so. Things just don't die the first year until they get rooted. I think especially what we've seen in um, the residential side of things is a lot of the arborvitaes go up during the earlier part of construction, and so you're still permitted. Right. And these arborvitaes are dying. We have a, a great right. case on Oak Street, Oak right. and 7th, where they were dying. So I think that that is something I think very early on that you'd need to get ahead on, right? And and it's easy, you, you know, to move the soaker sprinkler right. every tree. Right, 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 right. Maybe we. But that's a thought. That yeah, I think, I think we, we should. That. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. My question, I don't think it's a question. It's so, I think for a lot of this, it would be, I'm thinking, um, you know, these institutions that would be in, embedded in residential areas would be. In, in my mind, churches, and I know a lot, a lot of these churches are developed and not redeveloping, but how would that look in terms of, would we take a look at, or would it open the door for people to look at, you know, their church down the street from them, or a lot of properties abutting a church, and, and taking a look at this, the neighbors looking at this new text amendment and saying, hey, you know, this doesn't fit. We can't do it. We can't apply it retroactively, right? So this would be for, this would so be for that was redevelopment. My comment. Yeah. So yeah. we'd have to wait for yeah for redevelopment. The it's redevelopment of right. the church, and I think right. that was what I was trying or to. Or the minimum a major adjustment. Major, yeah. yeah. This was right. part of a huge sure, project. Sure, sure. Yeah. And what we have here with the flexibility. So, for example, 
if they wanted to, if you have a church that's embedded right in a residential neighborhood mm -hmm. and you're following the letter of the law here, they'd have to put up six foot fence and six foot arborvitae all the way around the side yard and rear. We have the ability to waive that because right. it doesn't, you know, we might say, hey, we only want it in the rear yard. Right. We don't want it in the side yard, so it keeps the residential look. We've exactly got the, that. The okay. board's got the ability right. to do that. Right, because right. 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 obviously that wouldn't fit with, the, you know, the right. multiple and the way, churches on my street. Right, and the way that would go through, it would go through the planning commission, they would come sure. back with a recommendation, and then it would be up to us. And we waive that. Right. And you would waive that. Right. Thank you. Anything I, else? I, I've got a few questions. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I read in a few places just in the discussion that there was a requirement to have a wall and landscaping, and I didn't see where that came up in the ordinance, ordinance. itself. It talked about, like, <clears throat> like I'm looking on pages eight and nine, where it talks about having a combination of different things, including walls and landscaping, but I didn't see where. It doesn't specifically require a wall, okay. but it gives the flexibility to, to do a combination of screening. R right, um, that's methods. what I saw, right. Yep. Okay. And that okay. was specific to what we just discussed of there may be a case where you couldn't even fit both. Right. And maybe, right. Or there might be a case where a, a residential neighbor doesn't want a fence or one or the other, so yep. that okay. discussion can be there. Okay, I, that, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Um, another question I had, so for the, um, the perimeter around uh, the parking lots, um, I was wondering why it wasn't an option to have like a low wall around. And I can think about certain, you know, circumstances where you might rather have, you know, like a three foot three wall, foot wall rather than landscaping. I know it talks about like at the entrance to the parking lot having like a little wall, but like, you know, you could see where like, um, you know, like a car dealership for, you know, security reasons may like the idea of having, you know, a wall all the way around. Y yes, okay, a wall all the way around uh, the property um, rather than some landscaping. Right, but that would be for the car dealership, but I think the residents would rather have landscaping, right? Because they don't want to see the, the tops of the cars, right? Wouldn't they want to have something that's higher than a three foot wall? Um, if you well, the, if you the the uh, I'm, I'm looking at the plannings along the edges of parking lots. It, it only has to be three, three feet tall. Is, yeah, right. But that's that's to start lights. with, right? Won't they grow yeah. taller? They would grow taller. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know that with a shrub necessarily yeah. grow Marginally. taller. Yeah. I think it's if, not a tree. If I lived next to a dealership, say, and there were cars in and out or test driving cars, I think I would want vegetation. Uh, well, uh, obviously yes, vegetation, but not a fence, but a concrete buffer. Uh, and right. I'm, I'm right. talking like a, about like a, like like a, a three foot brook, a, so is this brick a, wall. So is this a safety or, issue or is this an aesthetic issue? Right. Well, well I, 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 I guess my point is that you might better. you yeah. might have safety or security reasons why you'd prefer right. a wall. Right. And so if you, if it, you know, if the wall was aesthetically pleasing, whether it was stone or brick right. or something like that, shouldn't that be an option? Okay, all right. But okay. I, it is, it, it is, is, yeah. If yeah. You, We're if looking on page 11, yep. under okay. C under planting, it's an alternative. Okay. It is an alternative, it'd be something that would be brought to the plant commission and the village board. And there may be cases like, I'm sure you guys have seen this, even like a good example, McDonald's does this well, a lot, not that we have that, but like if you're at an intersection corner, sometimes they'll do a nice cute low masonry wall and it doesn't mean they have like all the screening around it, but they might use it as like a decorative feature, but it'd be something that would be brought forward and if it wasn't a good idea for that particular site or we really did need the screening, it could be looked at differently. But providing some flexibility because walls sometimes are a little bit better in a more of a downtown environment versus bigger shrubs. We just added it in to, to give the alternative option, but either way, that would be approved by the village. Okay, board. So, the, so the reference to parking lot edges, that's like basically the all the way around Correct. the parking lot? Okay. Yep, except where you'd have like the residential side, like a three foot wall would not work there. I, I see, okay. That wouldn't be used for like the screening between residential, that's just to screen the actual parking lot from the sidewalk and the street. Oh, 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 okay. Although the wall in lieu of the plantings really would have helped us out at Land Rover. The wall, um, what? The wall. Yeah. So what's what's the difference between B, I'm looking at the bottom page 10 and the top of page 11, what's the difference between B and C? 
Um, B just talks about the location and the width of that area around the parking lot. Okay. So it can't be, it says where it would be. So this would basically be the front and corner side yards. Once again, this wouldn't apply to like any of the buffer areas between single family residential. Okay. Just kind of those street edges to, to give some uh, screening from, from the actual sidewalk or the street. Um, and then C talks about the planting options. So we, we went over this at Planning Commission where we definitely wanted that minimum height to at least be three feet. Right. And then there may be cases where a low wall with some shrubs, perennials, other things to also break up the wall might be something to consider. Soften it up a little bit. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. And then my, um, the last question I had, um, and this is the requirement for having sort of, uh, you know, the islands in the parking lot. And so I, the standard here is 15 spaces. And I just was wondering like, what was the thinking in terms of the 15 space, you know, minimum? Why not 10, why not 20? I, I, you know, I'm not, I was trying to sort of visualize different properties around town, you know, that, you know, that were inside or outside of that limitation. I just, I, any, I I think that's that. just a standard requirement for most municipalities. That's just the, the number okay. that they yeah. use. Okay. It by all means doesn't mean that it's going to work everywhere. And right. the nice thing with this is we have added a section of, you know, there might be, like you just said, there might be a parking lot that has only 10 long, but it's got, you know, for three or four rows deep. And so we're at least allowing people to combine where necessary to. So there is some flexibility, I think, written in where we did allow people to combine if needed. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have an opinion. Yeah. I just, I just, we've got that already in there. Plus, that. yeah, I've seen this before in other communities. I think that's really important because if you look at a large parking lot that doesn't have any at all, it's just straight black. I mean, right. It's yeah. Not good. Right. Yeah. Right. But like, so like, to like clarify, land, does landlord have a problem? Yeah. You would only need <clears throat> interior parking landscaping if there was a parking lot with 15 spaces. Right. So no, nothing with less than that would need interior, but they'd still do the exterior. Right, right, yeah. And okay. then the every 10 um, spaces, <clears throat> that's pretty standard. Okay. Just with how other cooks have done okay. it. Okay. I got a couple others. Yep. Um, page 11, we're kind of talking about that. Um, it, if I look at the picture on page 11 and say that it's the Land Rover dealer and the principal structure is the, let's say, the showroom, Yep. is the public right-of-way, could that be Ogden Avenue? I, I assume that's could be a street? In that case, it would have been Ogden Avenue. Yeah. Okay, so we're saying that they have to, now these trees that are right on Ogden, those are not, not trees, I guess, that we have to put in, but these green trees they would have to put those in. And it would seem to me the car dealer would want to have, you know, they want to show their cars to people driving along Ogden <coughs> Avenue. And, and this is something we could just say, well, okay, forget it. You don't have to do this. I right. guess. Right. 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 Okay. Okay. right. For that right. case. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. That's a great one other question. quick one then. Page 13. I may not be looking at this right. Residential recreational facilities. It says outdoor residential recreational facilities um, in a single family residential district. If you have some type of entertainment, like a trampoline or a jumpy jump, the, the way I the way I read this probably incorrectly is that it has to be invisible from the street. Is, is that is that what we're saying there? This is our existing code section, so nothing has been proposed to change yeah. on this. But and we can clean up the language to make it a little bit more clear. We just haven't changed subsection J, K, or L. Those are all the existing. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, a friend of mine's got a. I can see sure. the trampoline in their backyard from the street, but I mean, you see a lot of trampolines in side yards. Yeah. Some in front yards. It's just, it's it's in it's in the existing code. It's yeah. just at least in the 20 years I've been here, it's something that I have. It's just not been enforced. Yeah, this goes to Scott's enforcement issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, you know, it, but if someone puts well, a trampoline in their front yard, I thought this was I thought yards, this was new here, or somebody has a tennis court in their I'm just side yard. Like a pool, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can't put a pool. In no. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Michelle <laughs> to do that too. I, know you, I try. I know. <laughs> okay. I'm done. All right. Scott? The only the only other question, again, I, I keep circling back to enforcement, and I know this is about standards, but one of the questions that I, that, that again, came to my mind was that, does the, and it's more of a question than anything else, is that what is the village's obligation in terms of 
the enforcement piece of it. So, for instance, if you have landscaping that you know that that doesn't survive, are we obligated for two years? Are we obligated for sixty so, days? What is, what's the duration of so time? For example, when you have a site plan approval, the landscaping plan is approved, and this is the way that it exists now. So, if we let's take one ten Ogden Avenue for an example, so if those if those arborvitae trees die three four years down the road they're not in compliance with their landscaping plan then they have to replace those so again i think realistically the way that it works we're not out policing those trees driving by them once every six months if the house behind them complains and say hey they're not those trees are dead they're obligated to go out and replace them but that that's what we have now. so it's built into permit basically yeah understood all right Again, so one thing that we haven't talked about is we've, it's written in here right now that, and I, I'd like consideration from the board, the trustees and President Colley, we don't have to do this, but we've got six feet for arborvitae and we've got six feet for fencing or any combination thereof. With the board having the authority to increase that if necessary. So if we are in a situation like 110 Ogden Avenue, we would probably increase the height of the trees or Land Rover where it's a heavier commercial use versus an office or a dentist office, you know, we're gonna increase that. Should I just submit this for everyone's consideration, should we start at eight feet and give us the ability to decrease yeah. it? Yeah. I think that's appropriate, yeah. I think so. The, yeah. the, the thing you have to worry about, because um, I know this because I planted trees, is the taller the tree, the bigger the ball, the less mm -hmm. close you can plant them together. So if you have too high arborvitae, you, the trees will never go to grow together. You know, smaller trees will grow together because they have a smaller ball and the landscaper will put one next to the other. Okay. So you got to worry about that. Yeah. That's the only issue. But I don't know that the difference between eight, eight and six makes the difference because I was using like 14 feet. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so okay. but I, I agree. It's, it's always easier to go down than up. Yeah. So let's do that with both. And like 36 um, inches is standard. Yes. Yep. I think 30. And that was a big, that was a, um, and, which uh, Alexis just asked is, you know, 36 inches for around the uh, parking lots. A lot of the plan commissioners wanted to leave it at 18 to 24 inches, but one of the plan commissioners did a great deal of research on other sure. communities, and 36 inches was pretty standard. I think that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's good too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, I, there's no rush to this. We can put it on for a second read next time. I've got follow-up items uh, uh, for a cheat sheet. Uh, we talked about minimum size of trees already. Uh, we talked about the required water plan or, you know, making sure that that's included. Yep. Um, so I would suggest we put it on for a second read, but again, if trustees read more carefully through this or something comes to them, there's no rush. We can, you know, put it on for a second read at the, at the meeting following that. Because right. we just got it Friday too and there was a yeah, to there's a lot here. Yeah, Sunday, yeah. and then it took plan commission. Alexis had to read, uh, watch the yeah, It took plan commission nine <laughs> months. So, yeah. Yeah. No, no urgency. Yeah. No it's urgency on this, yeah. But I think it's a, it's great. It's a good yeah. move. It yeah. is a good move. Really well done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well done by the board. Yeah. And one thing, one thing I would applaud staff for on this, you know, this is, we all have this at work. This is one of these projects which is not a necessity. So, uh, but usually it's it nice, doesn't get done. So it doesn't get done. <laughs> right. This is something that right. they've, got done. they've, they've yeah. driven. Because yeah. we'll wish it was done when we have our next right. big development. Right, so, the next and, land right. comes. We're going to wish that we had it. Same thing with a lighting plan. Right. Yeah, because the project may not come up for two years. Right, right. exactly. We'll apply this. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to accounts payable, I think. Okay, I had the uh, I had the suitcase and it's carefully stashed in the trunk of my car carrier. I want you to know that. So maybe I'll get it after a meeting. But I found everything to be in order and I'm going to move to approve payment of the accounts payable for the period of September 20th, 2024 through October 10th, 2024, in the aggregate amount of $1,373,573.74, as set forth on the list provided by the village treasurer, of which a permanent copy is on file with the village clerk. Second. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Pashima? Aye. Trustee Braden? Aye. Trustee Siffler? Aye. Trustee Fisher? Aye. Trustee Burns? Aye. Trustee Bain? Aye. So we have one consent agenda item 7B. I have a motion with respect to that. You know, move, to, move to approve consent agenda item 7B. Second. 
Roll call vote. Trustee Pashima? Aye. Trustee Braden? Aye. Trustee Sibler? Aye. Trustee Fisher? Aye. Trustee Burns? Aye. Trustee Bank? Aye. And Matt, 7A, Braid A? 8A, yes. Uh, item 8A, second read. Um, this is a uh, resolution uh, determining the estimated property tax levy for 2024. Um, talked about this at our last meeting. Um, uh, property taxes represent 40% of the village revenues, although the village's portion of your property tax bill is only about 7%. Um, our general policy has been to uh, raise uh, property taxes as, as much as we can within the statutory limits uh, in order that we can keep up with you know, our expenses. Um, the levies are generally capped at the lesser of 5% um, or CPI uh, plus new construction. So uh, CPI for the last year was 3.4%. And then with the um, new construction, it's based on uh, the 2023 permits, uh, the estimated increase in uh, EAV for the new construction is 16.33 million. And so the uh, increased uh, property taxes as a result of the cap portion of our levy is 4.19% uh, or uh, 8,740,598 dollars. Um, first, uh, of the 8.7 million, the uh, first portion of it is allocated to our police and fire pensions. Um, those uh, actuarial requirements are determined by state statute. They're both uh, over $1.3 million. Uh, the police uh, uh, pension liability in particular went up quite a bit uh, this last year. Uh, and then the, uh, the remainder of that 8.7 million uh, is gonna be split equally between uh, police and fire uh, protection. Uh, we also have uncapped amounts of about $334,804. And there's a small piece of our fire pension uh, liability, which is uncapped. We have our Gateway uh, Special Recreation Association uh, for uh, disabled residents, which is uncapped. And then we have one uh, unabated debt payment, uh, which is uncapped. So our total uh, estimated village levy would be uh, $9,075,402. That's a 4.14% increase for the village's portion. And then we also have the library portion, um, which is going to be determined by the library board. Um, but if that increases at the same rate that we're able to increase, which is the 4.19% for the cap portion, that would be uh, a little over $3.8 million. So our total estimated levy, village and library, again, subject to uh, the library board's determination, would be uh, $12,908,521. Again, that's an aggregate 4.15% uh, increase. And uh, uh, assuming we pass this resolution, the next step would be at our November meetings to consider the uh, levy ordinance and uh, the abatements for uh, debt payments where there's alternative revenue sources. Kara, anything else? That's exactly it. Thank All you. Right. Excellent. Any questions? All right. In that case, I will move to approve a resolution determining the estimated Village of Hinsdale real estate tax levy for year 2024. Second. We'll call vote. Trustee Pashima? Aye. Trustee Braden? Aye. Trustee Stifler? Aye. Trustee Fisher? Aye. Trustee Burns? Aye. Trustee Banky? Aye. So 8B, do you want me to take that, Matt, or? Um, I, I can do it. Okay. Um, but feel free to. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so uh, item 8B, uh, which um, uh, President Cauley talked about in our um, <coughs> discussion point of our meeting at our last meeting, uh, is to provide uh, for a public hearing for establishing a special service area uh, for 6th Street between uh, Garfield and County Line Road for the reconstruction of the existing brick road. Um, so uh, as President Colley discussed at our last meeting, 6th Street is one of the last brick roads in the village and um, uh, the state of Illinois has required that the water and sewer infrastructure under the street be replaced 
and as a result, that means that the uh, brick road also has to be replaced. And there's been uh, many discussions with uh, the residents of 6th Street over the last uh, year as to uh, how that road should be uh, replaced, um, whether we do it with asphalt or with brick, and, uh, and how to pay for it. So the, uh, the estimated marginal cost of um, having a brick road instead of asphalt is uh, thought to be about $2.8 million. And uh, the village has offered to residents to pay uh, the cost of a hybrid approach, which would basically be having asphalt streets and then uh, having uh, brick intersections and then crosswalks and then sort of the entrance, entrances to uh, that's the 6th Street corridor on the county line and on the, uh, the Garfield side. And so the, um, the special service area would pay for the additional cost of a full brick road on 6th Street up to uh, $2 million. Um, the proposed special service area, although this will ultimately be determined at the hearing, um, is proposed to be composed of uh, 38 properties which are abutting 6th Street um, between uh, County Line and Garfield Road. And it's proposed that the additional property tax levy would uh, take place over a 10-year period. The village would also have the ability to um, uh, do a uh, financing with bonds uh, to finance the cost of the property for also over that 10 year period at an interest rate of up to 7%. Um, and that additional finance cost would be also included in the property tax levy. Residents would have the ability to uh, prepay their portion uh, of the cost of the brick road in order to avoid uh, having to pay those interest costs. And uh, if the village was able to obtain additional funding, uh, uh, before the ordinance passes, that $2 million amount could uh, decrease. Now, um, the, uh, the public hearing as proposed would be on uh, December 17. Notice will be published in the Hinsdalian and uh, will also be mailed to the residents uh, in the special service area. After the public hearing, uh, residents will have uh, 60 days to uh, object. And uh, in order to uh, object, you would need to have 51% uh, of the registered voters in this proposed special service area, as well as 51% of the owners uh, in the special service area. Both, both of those groups, you'd have to have 51% objecting. If there's no objection, um, then the village board could uh, move forward to establish the special service area at their meeting on February 28 or later. Now, uh, as I understand it, the proposal would be to put uh, bids out uh, for uh, uh, the road, both as an all brick uh, option and as a hybrid option in uh, January, um, with the idea that the bids would come back in, uh, in mid February. Contract, again, assuming this all moves forward, the idea of that would be that the uh, bids would be awarded uh, in March, and then the construction could take place over the following year. Um, Carrier George, anything else you want to say about that? Uh, one item about you discussed with the prepayment. Yeah. So I think originally. We had assumed that it would only residents would only want to prepay if it was a two million dollar bond because of the interest costs. Yep. If the village obtains this alternate funding and is able to then reduce um, the special service area to a, a significant um, decreased amount uh, to where there would not be interest, there may still be residents that would like to prepay um, because they'd want to be excluded from the special service area or for whatever you know reasons, even though there wouldn't be an interest component. And we had discussed, this kind of came up um, recently, the timing of that. And just to be clear, it has to occur after the public hearing, but before the next board meeting. Is that correct, Michael? Right, it has to, the, the latest that we can remove a property from the special service area. Wait, are we talking about financing or are we talking about properties? Proper, property. Well, 
if people property. prepay, right. they're, they're, they're oh, outside I see. of they're the out area. Of it. Right. So, so we hold the public hearing, the latest so we can remove a property from the special the service area uh, based on prepayment or bo uh, another board decision to remove it would be the next public meeting after that public hearing or the next regular board meeting after that public hearing. So public hearing so on December 7th. So in January? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So okay. we are uh, kind of working through the mechanics of that and right. we're gonna prepare documents related to prepayment. Now the problem is we won't know the, um, the total cost of the road yet because of the bid. So we're right. coming up with a plan to address that where people will repay and possibly get rebated portion of the, their prepayment based on uh, right. it coming out lower. Right, but, but from my perspective, I mean, I think the, a lot of the details will hopefully shake out as we go along yep. because I think I mean, my thought is the two million dollars. Th the thing about an SSA is you can, you can, you can reduce it, but you never can increase it, mm -hmm. right? So, yep. so, so it, as Matt said, we, we we're going to pay eight hundred thousand dollars for the hybrid. We're also going to contribute that to All Brick Road. So the maximum would be would be two million dollars for the residents. So if there's if it's if it, if the bids come in slightly higher than that, we would, the village would pick up the difference. We would, the, the residents would never be paying more. Than two million dollars, if that's if that's what is required. Our hope is that between because this, we're starting the process now, by the time that we get to the end of the year, we will have a better feel for how much it would cost to complete the project and whether we can reduce the cost of the project. If we do that, it would come down. Okay, and that's and that's so so we can always reduce it. We can't increase it. So my hope is we put that as a placeholder, and my hope and and my thought would be that by the time we get to the end of the year, that $2 million is going to be a, a low. And as Carrie pointed out, one of the benefits to residents is if you bring that number down from $2 million, there's a possibility for the village to do internally finance it rather than go out to, to a bonding agency, in which case the residents would not have to pay the interest because the village would finance it internally, and in which case it would probably make no sense to prepay. It only makes sense to prepay if you're if you're cutting out the interest because I mean why if you're gonna if it's a flat amount why why pay it up front rather than pay it over time. Right. So so I view this as a placeholder and my hope is by the time we get to the public hearing on December seventeenth and certainly by the time we get to the opt out period in February, that we have a much lower number to work with. That's our hope. I mean residents can always approve the two million dollars if God forbid that's where we end up. My hope is we come to a much lower number. A number that that we can finance internally, which would make it much, much lower, less than half. We're not going to know the cost of the road until we will. No, February, no. Right? I, th I we. I'm. I'm. I think the cost of the road. I think we've told residents we've we've kind of done a lot of work on that. The extent it's slightly over, the residents are going to bear that. We're going to we'll pick that up. The extent there's a there's a delta between what it costs, and I think there's probably there's contingencies built in. I, I don't think it's going to cost more, but certainly it costs less. The, the, the cost of the SSA could come down if you know that by, we, we, the, the, we'll get back the bids in mid-February. And if, we, if we're close to that time, maybe we can just kind of move the February 16th objection period or something, I don't know. But I, I, the, the, it's so, not so much the cost of the project I'm looking to as ways to, re, to supplement the funding for this is what I'm looking right. to. And I think that's gonna be the big, the thing we'll know by the end of the year. Right, right. Um. If there weren't additional revenue sources, are you, Carrie, are you comfortable with the 7%? Yeah, that's the maximum. We had that vetted out by Spear. So okay. $2 million is the maximum bond. 7% is the maximum interest rate. Okay. Bill, you have any comments, thoughts? Uh, I, I just want to uh, clarify. So when we're talking about opt out, we're, we're really talking about two different things. One is a resident could opt out at the board meeting in January from the SSA by prepaying their full amount, whatever that is determined to be by carry. That's different from a majority of homeowners Correct. and voters of record. Correct. Uh, potentially saying we don't want to do do it at all. Right. Do it at all. That that deadline would come in February. Right. Correct. So so in the event that somebody had prepaid and then it was later an objection received that killed the SSA, uh, that money would be refunded in full to those residents who prepaid. Yeah. 
but what happens but if they are separate. What happens if a resident's prepaid, the number goes down, and we internally fund it? We re refund, we, we refund yes. the money. Same. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But when you say object, uh, change your terminology. Yeah. Well, it the objection would be if it meets those two criteria. Correct. I so mean, there may be residents who don't want to be a, a part of it, but that's not. legal objection based on the 50% of electors and 50% of residents, yeah. um, then the village is prevented from going forward. That's what we mean by objection. Right. right. Yeah. But, but, but then, but, as I understand it, it's also possible for someone at the public hearing to say, I don't think I should be in the special service area. Right. Yes. And we could, and we as a board could decide whether we agree. Right, but there are, there are certain rules on that too. You, it's got to be contiguous properties, right? You can't pluck somebody out of the middle of a special service area and say you're exempt. I mean, I think, I but, think you can modify. Right, I know definition. there are rules on it. Yeah, um, but it's got to be contiguous properties, as I understand. It. Right. Is that right? That that's correct. Although in this case, because of the street yeah. uh, being included as a parcel, yeah. everybody touches. Okay. Right. So we're going to maintain uh, contiguity you, regardless. You could, you could take somebody out, right? And it would, everyone would still be right adjacent okay. to yes. the street, right? Which is which is the the fortieth parcel. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. But then, if you take somebody out, it, you know, everybody else's share increases right. proportionally. Right. That's an issue. I hope we don't have to address. Right. I hope we don't have to address that. I would just say that the resident group came up with the 38 properties right. based not on do you have a 6th Street address or do you have a driveway on 6th Street, but rather do you own private property that abuts 6th Street on one of those right. four blocks. Right. Right. Um, mm -hmm. right. right. That, that's, right. that's what we use to determine that. Otherwise, right. it becomes rather arbitrary. It does become rather arbitrary. Okay. And I just want to mention, I think someone said February 28th as the first possible day to adopt the ordinance. It's February 18th. And to be clear, you can't opt out, right? There are ways to not be included in the SSA, and that would be through a prepayment, but you're not opting out. Correct. Right. Where, where, where would we vote on, on modifying the SSA would that be at the at the December yeah, I mean, meeting? I, I really don't want to I don't want to characterize that as an option. I mean I think yeah. that I, I think well, the, the way I would view it is we have thirty eight properties and we approve an SSA for thirty eight properties. Mm -hmm. I mean I think that if we start entertaining individual properties and that I'd, I'd rather not I I just would rather not go there. I mean I think we we take it as the, the resident group put it together and we and we we vote on it. And if, and if there's 50, and if, if, if there's not the, the requisite number of, of um, property owners and registered voters who don't want it, you know, then, then obviously it fails. But I think tinkering with the number of, of homes in it is kind of, that's just, that's just asking for problems, in my view. I mean, I think we, there's consideration given by the residents for this. This is largely driven by the 6th Street residents. And I think it has to be a pretty compelling reason to take somebody out, but I just, I would rather just, you know, have the 38 homes have the SSA figure whether people want to oppose it or not and it it, it it flies or doesn't fly based upon you know resident objections rather than inviting people to give us an argument as to why their property shouldn't be included I just don't think that's a I, I just don't think we should do that I mean that's the point of the public hearing though right no it's a point the, no the point of the public hearing would be more not that my property should be excluded the public hearing would be I don't think we should do this because um, I do think that, as Bill said, there's a there's a rationale for everybody who's access to Sixth Street to be included. I mean, obviously that people can make that argument, but that's not one that I think, from my perspective, would be very sympathetic to. I think that the that the argument would be sympathetic to is if 51 percent of the people don't want it at all. Does that does that make sense to you? Yes. Yeah. Because I mean, the last thing you want in a situation like this is pitting resident against resident, and so that's I try to avoid that. And you know, and I, and back years ago when we had some special service areas, when when I was a trustee, we had that issue in the Woodlands. We did not have that issue um, with um, downtown the parking garage. We have an SSA. We didn't have that issue. So I think that if you can make it so that it seems fair to everybody and the money's manageable, you know, if everybody agrees that this is a good thing for the street. I just I. I I guess this is maybe a subtle point. 
certainly people can say I don't want to be part of it, but I don't want to invite that or highlight that as an option because I think that the 38 homes make sense to me. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty confident based on our discussions over the last nine, 10 months that there will be people who do not want to be a part, would prefer not to be a part of it uh, for whatever reason. Uh, they, they're, they feel philosophically object to the village not paying for it they don't have a driveway on six, they don't have a six street, whatever the reason may be. Right. Um, and that's their right uh, to not want to be a part of it. But to Kathleen's point, at, this is, these are the homes that we've come up with as a group. Right. Based on everyone owning property on six street, we feel you benefit from the street if you have property on six street. Right, right. Because I guess what, I, what I'm thinking of is I don't know that an SSA could fly. We have like a checkerboard of homes that want to be in and homes that want to be out. I mean, I think, I think you got to say, this is the group of homes we've picked. There's a rationale for it. This is the best way to spread the cost. If you object to it, you're one of the objectors, but this is the SSA. Because I mean, it seems to me in a project like this, the more variables you interject into it, the more problems you have. So I, my suggestion is we, we stick with the 38. Unless somebody makes a compelling case that my house is just, you know, for some reason, they're just in a unique situation geographically versus 6th Street. But my suggestion is we don't entertain just taking people out of an SSA and have just people, you know, and so you're left with, you know, instead of 36 homes, you're left with 15 homes, and these people are paying twice as much. I mean, it just, I, it just, there's an unfairness element to it. There's a residence against resident element to it. And I think just becomes unworkable. I mean, I think the board has to stick with the 38 homes and either if residents don't want it, fine. If residents do want it, fine. When we are championing this for residents and doing it in a way that the residents we talk to believe is the fairest way to allocate the costs. Exactly. And so there will probably be some contention already, but it would be worse if we start plucking people out. Exactly. I completely agree with exactly. that. Exactly. And if 51% of the people don't want it, it won't go forward. That's, that's correct. We, we all understand that. Yeah. Right. And we've had a lot of discussions. Yeah. So, okay, thank you. So we have to vote on, somebody have to make a motion, we, we, I guess? We do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. Um, so I move to approve an ordinance proposing the establishment of special service area number 15 in the village of Hinsdale and providing for a public hearing and other procedures in connection therewith. Second. <coughs> Roll call vote. Trustee Pashima? Aye. Trustee Braden? Aye. Trustee Siffler? Aye. Trustee Fisher? Aye. Trustee Burns? Aye. Trustee Banky? Aye. Question items, anything on the tollway? None. 150th update, Michelle? The new furniture is on the patio. Uh, it looks beautiful. <coughs> George, thank you. November 19th is our tentative dedication ceremony date, and I'm hoping invitations uh, and more information about that day will be coming out shortly. Thank you. Staff reports. <coughs> Citizens petition. Anything else, Bill? Trustee comments. I have something. Sure. If that's okay. Sure. Um, I'd like to take a second to tell Hinsdale's Historic Preservation Commission, HPC, we have a, a commissioner actually here in the audience. Uh, last night's meeting, we saw major headway with preservation. Three really important cases were heard in front of the HPC. One, um, which received a lot of rec recognition a couple years ago, was the Frank Lloyd Wright Bagley House at 121 South County Line Road. Um, it took a little bit with their um, forensic discovery and the <coughs> work. Um, to really outline uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's original drawings of the house and how they can renovate to make it modern for um, this day and age. And um, there's a wonderful model over here if any trustees or staff would like to take a look at it. I know that will also be on the November 5th uh, board uh, hearing here. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. And then two other really important cases were heard. Um, one is a house by the middle school and the owners have really thoughtfully renovated it and they are applying for landmark status which I think is a huge win for uh, preservation here in Hinsdale. And thirdly, a home that we've talked about recently. It was um, 
in jeopardy of being demolished. Um, a family bought it. It was a win-win. Sellers and buyers, in my opinion, came together to save this house. And Michael Abraham presented last night um, on a really thoughtful renovation of that home. So kudos to the HPC, to its commissioners, to Chairman Bonin, for Bethany, for really steering the HPC, HPC rather on these uh, preservation incentives under Title 14. Thanks, Alexis. Anything else? Any other trustees? Sorry, since you brought it up, <laughs> uh, I do want to say that uh, I think, I, I can't speak officially for the HPC commissioners, but I know we all feel that the program that was put in place by the board uh, for the village to be a part of this grant effort for preservation has made a difference. Yeah. Uh, we're getting many more of these types of situations where people are renovating rather than tearing down. Great. So occasionally you'll see some objection to it in the paper, but Overall, uh, I think it's been a great turn. And so, um, thank you. Great. Thanks, Bill. Agreed. Anyone else? Any other trusted comments? <clears throat> no reason for a closed session. Could I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Pashman? Aye. Trustee Braden? Aye. Trustee Siffler? Aye. Trustee Fisher? Aye. Trustee Burns? Aye. Trustee Bank? Aye. Thank you.